Welcome to Don't Retire, Graduate, the podcast that asks you what you want to be when you grow up so you can graduate into retirement with purpose and passion. I'm your host and valedictorian, Eric Brotman, and today our guest is Joseph Hogue. Joseph is the Chief Awesome Officer, yes, you heard that right, the Chief Awesome Officer at Let's Talk Money with Joseph Hogue. He was one of um, one of the folks that we met at FinCon who has just turned the, the financial media on its ear. Um, I, I, I am so excited to introduce you. Um, you run a YouTube channel that I have spent some time on, Joseph, that is, it has terrific content for consumers, for investors. Uh, and I want to go into to how you got started, but tell us a little bit about yourself first and let's go from there. Sure. Well, Eric, thanks for having me. Uh, it's great to be here. It's a little overwhelmed talking to the, the valedictorian here because I was definitely not uh, the valedictorian of I. my class when I graduated. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, yeah, you know, just uh, just uh, an honor to be here. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, started started an equity analyst uh, analysis after the Marine Corps. Uh, loved immediately fell in love with the idea of making your money work for you. Right, the idea of you know. Uh, having your money build on itself. So I went into uh, venture capital, uh, equity analysis, private wealth management. And there was a point though that that I realized I wasn't really talking to who I was. I wasn't really talking to, to where I came from. I was talking to you know that 1% that, that is uh, able to access the venture capital, the private wealth management, things like that. So I uh, realized that, you know, I wanted to get back to, to, to Main Street and Main Street investors, started some blogs in 2014, positioned or transitioned that to, to in 2017 to the YouTube channel. And uh, it's just been amazing since uh, just exponential growth, 565,000 uh, members in the community there. And I love that face to face feel you get with uh, with YouTube and being able to reach people on a, you know, kind of a personal level. Well, I'm, I'm a couple of years behind you, Joseph, in terms of uh, transitioning to video. So I, I've, there's a lot I can learn from you today, which is great. Uh, what I'm hoping our audience will come away with today is some some actionable items, some some tips. You talk a lot about equity investing. You talk a lot about stocks. Um, you remind me of a, a very mellow and thoughtful Jim Cramer. Uh, and I mean that as a compliment, uh, not to compare you to someone screaming at I'm, the television. I'm looking for the buttons on my desk that, that right. scream out no. stuff at you. I, you know, I, 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 I'm glad you're not frenetic, um, but, but you, you are very passionate about what you're doing and, um, and specifically about equity. So talk a little bit about equities and sort of how they uh, should be positioned typically in a portfolio and are they for everyone? Sure, sure. Well, uh, uh, equities or, or stocks, right, are, are just, it's, it's almost an underrated uh, investment, I think. And as much as we hear about stocks, I, I think people uh, have this kind of arbitrary, uh, confused notion of what they are. Stocks are actually an ownership of a company. You can actually own part of Disney, part of Apple, uh, part of Coca-Cola, and really you benefit from the earnings and the cash flow that those those stocks, those companies spin off, right? So, so when you're investing, you are uh, buying an ownership. You don't have to run your own company. You don't have to uh, be an entre entrepreneur. You can be an entrepreneur in an already established company. Uh, and so that's the great thing about it is you can uh, everybody can benefit from that that American dream of starting your own company, but you don't actually have to start your own company. You just invest in uh, one that's already established. You you have a right because you are an owner of that company. You have a right to the earnings uh, into perpetuity, into forever. There's there's a lot of um, trepidation around stock investing, stock market investing. Um, some people will tell you, oh my gosh, it's so risky. Why would I, why would I do that? Um, and, and human behavior, and I've actually seen you did a show about behavioral investing, which I, which I loved. You, human behavior will lead us to do exactly the wrong thing at exactly the wrong time naturally where you know the markets have dropped a little bit and your first inclination is oh my god run for the hills and leave and in fact as counterintuitive as it is that's almost the exact opposite advice that you want to give wasn't it isn't it a absolutely and i'm i'm so glad you brought that up because it is it is really that perspective that that hurts people investors so often uh we love to buy stocks as they're going up everybody's talking about getting rich and even your even your uber driver has the next hot stock pick right uh but then yeah. we we and then when stocks are coming down uh we panic and we sell and, and we you know we leave uh, many people leave the markets uh you know leave their investments for for years and years 
Uh, and and that's exactly the opposite of what we should be doing, right? If you're investing as stocks are going up, you never know when that's going to be the top for the next few years, right? You never know when that next stock market crash or that bear market is coming around. As stocks are coming down, though, as we are in a uh, you know a bear market right now, then you know you're getting a discount. You know you're getting prices better than what we got at the beginning of the year. So this is the time you should be buying your your best money. Your your highest returns are made in this kind of environment, in a bear market right now, as stocks are coming down. It's amazing to me that uh, I, I used to joke that when there's a sale on towels at Macy's, there's a line around the building at four o'clock in the morning on Black Friday. But when there's a sale on high quality companies on Wall Street, people think they're somehow defective. Like it's, it's, it's the rack, we don't want this. I don't understand that. Um, and, 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 you know, houses, it, it, real estate's often the same way, except that people, I think, understand that when real estate prices are depressed a little bit, it's a great time to buy. So why is it different with a house than it is with shares of XYZ company? It is, uh, I think it's a lot of the terminology we use, right? A stock market crash, a bear market. Uh, you don't want to get mauled with the next bear market, right? So I think mm -hmm. a lot of the terminology scares people. I think um, just that uh, just that idea of losing money, you know, as stock prices come down and watching a lot of people obsessively watch their portfolios every single day and, and see that that number, uh, you know, those digital dollars coming down and, and it scares them, it panics them uh, and they lose sight of that longer term picture where if there, if there is one guarantee in the stock market, one guarantee in investing, it's that stocks do eventually go higher. Uh, if you look at any stock chart over the last hundred years, uh, you will see those rises and falls, those little dips, but uh, they, they always go higher uh, within a few years. Sometimes, sometimes, and I use real estate as a great example here because stock markets crash, real estate has a crisis. Real estate doesn't crash, it has a crisis. Uh, and, and that kind of nomenclature does create, um, it, it does create something. You don't see housing prices dipped 5% today as the lead story on the news. But what the Dow did, which by the way is all of 30 stocks that you probably own as part of a much more broad, diverse allocation, but what the Dow did is somehow on everybody's, it's on everybody's lips. People can tell you what the Dow number is, but they actually don't know what the index means uh, in a sure. lot of different well, ways. Um, now, Zillow's changing that, Joseph. I, I, have, I have found, and I, I'm gonna confess to my audience, that one of the things that, that I do, I, I certainly track my own personal balance sheet and my personal portfolio, like I do for, for clients and so forth. But I also put in the value of my home and I use the value from Zillow. And Zillow is now sending emails regularly to tell you about the price of your home if you wanted to, which is a brand new thing because it used to be you got your equity statement every month, but you didn't have to look at your home, home price unless you wanted to buy or sell. Well, now that's different. Now you're getting market updates on the house, which by the way are based on comps and aren't actually accurate in any way, but nonetheless, they come. And my confession and, and is, my confession is, I, I got to get this off my chest. I'm feeling, uh, I'm feeling it's very important. But my confession is that when the when the price of the house is higher than it was last time, I enter it into my system, and when it's lower, I don't. Yeah, <laughs> I swear, yeah, that's true. Because I can't, I can't grapple with the idea that my home got less valuable this week. That bothers yeah. me so much that I wait until it recovers. And, and, and besides your confession, so I, I don't know if I should be you know, giving you some <laughs> rosemary, you know, have you, have right. you do some Hail Marys or something, uh, which <laughs> Hail Marys, that's exactly the kind of Catholic I actually am. Uh, the uh, <laughs> But it kind of scares me a little bit because if we yeah. are moving the housing market more towards what we see in the stock market, those daily updates of, oh my God, Apple fell 5%, Amazon's down 10% uh, today. Mm -hmm. We are turning housing into, unfortunately, what investing has become over the last decade, an entertainment industry. Okay. And oh, that's, uh, that's really one of the worst things uh, we could have done to investing. And uh, something I, I think a lot of investors need to understand is that a lot of what you see on TV, on YouTube, on, on online about investing is pure entertainment. Uh, they are there to shock you, to uh, to get you to come back, to feel, to get you to need feel like you need their advice and their opinion every single day, um, mm -hmm. and, and to keep you coming back for those ad dollars. You know, and, and so it's not no, not so much not so much anymore about helping you make money, but about uh, about getting you to come back and sharing you and shocking you into those big numbers every single day. 
I was just recently asked, as recently as yesterday, to appear on a television show in Australia. And the topic they want me to talk about is why we shouldn't listen to the media, which is it's going to be fun because that's exact. You're, you hit it right on the you're head. on the media. Yeah. It's going to be fun. I have a love hate relationship with the media. I, I tell folks I don't watch the news unless I'm on it. Um, the, the reality is that it is entertainment and it's worse than that because some of it, especially when you go to the, the checkout at your local supermarket and somewhere between the Skittles and the M&Ms is a magazine that's the 10 stocks you wish you had bought three weeks ago when we printed this. To me, that's not just entertainment, it's pornography. It's a form of financial <laughs> pornography. Um, it's not financial graphic, porn, right? That's the term, it, right? <laughs> it is. It is. And they call it that because it's, it's literally garbage. And, and unfortunately, people don't know how to distill good, objective, sound, reasonable advice from bravado and, and especially in equity markets. Oh, you know, you talk private equity, you talk to hedge funds, and they all think they're the smartest you know, person on the block. How do you tell the difference between good logical advice and uh, someone who's just sort of a bit of a blowhard, pardon the expression? Sure. sure. And and it, it's only getting worse, and we don't realize it's getting worse, right? I was on, uh, you know, I was on my phone the other day and and, and looking through Google because I, I I keep like trying to keep up with the news, but mm -hmm. I found that you know one, a couple of the last times I was on there, I had clicked on you know some of those investing uh, articles or whatever, and now Google thinks that's all I want to see, so that is mm -hmm. all I see in that feed. You know, you go to Facebook, you go to some of the social media, and all their algorithms are based on what you've been watching, what they think you might be interested in. So they're going to serve you up that that same uh, that same trough of you know I, I don't want to get don't want to get vulgar on the show, but they're going to serve you up that same trough uh, every single time you, you reach. And and I think one of the best things any investor can do, whenever they're reading an article on investments, whenever they're watching something on investments, is try to think about how much time is dedicated in this article, in this video, to trying to teach you how to invest rather than what to invest in. Okay, if, if someone is teaching you how to invest, it's, it's the old, uh, you know, lead a horse to water uh, mm -hmm. or kind of thing, or, or teach a man, I'm getting my analogies mixed up, uh, teach a man to fish, right? Um, you know, so many of these YouTubers, so many of these articles want to uh, give you a fish. They want to tell you, hey, invest in XYZ and these seven stocks and you'll be rich. That does nothing for you except keeping you dependent on some Yahoo and a bow tie on YouTube, right? To, to pick your stocks for you. Right. So what I try to do in, in each of my videos, yeah, you know, I, I have to serve serve the needs. I have to, you know, help people pick stocks or, or show them which stocks I'm watching. But I also want to show people how to pick stocks and, and how to make their own decisions. You know, how to become a better investor. Uh, so that's really what you need to be on the watch for uh, for online. Anytime you're online, is okay. What are the parts of this video or what are the parts of this article teaching me how to invest? And that's what I want to pay attention to. Okay, I, I want to put you on the spot a little bit because um, the how-to I think is great. And, and I think it makes sense for, for people to understand how to invest. There, there are some people who absolutely should own individual common stocks and there's others for various reasons who maybe shouldn't. Sure. How, how do you first discern whether this is right for you in the first place? And how do you advise those folks who maybe aren't ready for that or who don't have the appetite for that uh, level of risk or maybe who don't have the uh, either the sophistication or just the time to do this, how do you sure. encourage those folks to move forward? What's the what's sure. the tipping point? I'm going to say something that's going to sound extremely hypocritical for a guy okay. on his YouTube channel that that talks about certain individual stocks a lot and which stocks I'm watching and which stocks I like. 99.9% uh, .9 of the people don't need individual stocks. They do not need, you, you do not need individual stocks. You need uh, index funds, which are which are ETFs, exchange traded funds, funds that, that hold groups of stocks around the indexes, right? So it's thinking NASDAQ, S&P 500, the entire stock market gives you that, mm -hmm. um, you know, bonds, real estate gives you that uh, market return, right? Mm -hmm. You need ETFs, right? These are, these are other exchange traded funds that maybe invest along a theme, but still hold hundreds, if not thousands of, of stocks in those and give you a really, a really smoothed out uh, market return. Uh, what happens though is, is of course the sexy part the entertainment part of of mm -hmm. investing is those picking those individual stocks and 
you know, we feel this need, this, uh, this drive to, to beat the market and to get rich. And uh, it becomes an addiction. And yes, my name is Joseph and I am an addict. Uh, I love that, <laughs> that, that idea. Uh, I love to follow stocks. I love to follow individual companies and pick individual stocks. So a couple different things here. Uh, one is, you know, very, you don't, you don't need individual stocks. You need to, to invest your money and let it grow uh, in in stocks and, and in funds in the uh, in the investment uh, you know space right uh, mm-hmm. you need to do what you do best to make money which for most for 99.9 percent of the people out there is not picking stocks uh, for 99 percent of people out there doing what they do best for to make money is something entirely different so they need to just put their money in an index fund in an ETF mm-hmm. Don't even worry about it. Set it on an automatic deposit each month from their check into their account, investing account and, and where it invests in those. Now, the problem is, though, again, we get back to that that need, that desire, that drive to, mm-hmm. uh, you know, maybe a little bit of that gambler's addiction to watch individual stocks, to pick stocks. And what happens is when if somebody with that, you know, like myself and like a lot of people out there, if they are, uh, if they do have that and then they have this very, this very long term fund driven uh, uh fund driven portfolio where it's just the funds and they're going to mess that up. They're going to want to go in there. They're going to want to trade in and out of those things. And those are very long-term investments that you should not be trading in and out. You should be holding those 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, So what I suggest is having maybe 10%, 15% or 20% at the most of your money, a very small sliver of your money in individual stocks. If you feel that need, that desire to to follow individual stocks, to pick pick stocks on your own, right? And then the rest of it, that 80%, you have in those funds, those market return funds that are going to give you the returns from stocks, bonds, and and real estate, those really broad-based returns. That way, if you completely mess up your 15% of your portfolio that you're that you're uh, picking individual stocks with, you still know the vast majority of it is going to get that market return and you're going to reach those financial goals, right? Uh, for those that don't have that itch, don't have that desire to pick individual stocks, you have all of it in the index funds and the ETFs and just don't worry about it. Just do what you do best to make money uh, and then put some of that money in the stock market. Let those companies and the management at those companies do what they do best and grow those companies and make you money through those funds. So is there a lot, I know there was a lot there was a lot in there, but uh, I think well, it's probably the best advice you can get, uh, you know, as, as far as investing. It's, it's refreshing to hear you say that because there are, um, for lack of a more graceful term, uh, certainly still some cowboys out there, some stock slingers who would, would disagree with you and think that the only way is to time in and out. And, and I, I just simply don't, I don't believe that market timing is possible or someone somewhere would have mastered it and no one has. Uh, Peter Lynch Eric, was pretty good think, at it. You don't think GameStop and, and AMC are going to all make us all oh, rich? Come man. on. Well, so so here's the and I think the 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 regulatory and and the um, the the litigation that's going to come out of that yet is still it remains to be seen. I think that the hammer's going to fall on folks who've been manipulating that or crypto or some of this other stuff where it's very easy for a high powered um, wealthy individual or fund or company to say, oh, we're going to start accepting crypto as currency and watch the thing go wildly up and then sell their shares and say, no, never mind, we're not going to accept it. It's market manipulation. And I'm not pointing fingers at any individual. I'm just saying it's very easy to do because there is that greed and that fear that that swings like a pendulum for for individual investors. Um, You have uh, a couple of rules of thumb. And I, I believe you referred to them as the three investing rules, the three things, uh, the three ways to not lose money in stocks. And as much as people like to talk about making money, it's actually much more painful to lose $100 than it is pleasurable to make $100. That's a, a behavioral, psychological certainty. So what are your three rules to not lose money in stocks? Can you share those with us? Sure. Well, uh, one, I think I would just go back to what I said before is have at least you know 65 75 percent of your money in those etfs in those funds uh, those index funds you're getting the market returns so no matter what the rest of your portfolio does you are getting the market returns and it is going to smooth out your uh your portfolio so you're not going to see the numbers jump up and down so mm-hmm, much quite mm-hmm. uh, every single day and you're not going to freak out right you're not going to panic and you're not going to run to, to sell those uh, Another benefit of those funds is since they do own hundreds and thousands of stocks, then um, you're, you're not really tempted to to sell those in a panic because 
uh, any individual company within that, say, say if uh, say if Amazon crashes 10% in a day within a fund, you really don't notice it within the fund. And, and it's really not a reason to sell that fund because one stock went up or down, right? So it's, there's very much less, uh, very much uh, less the, the, the impetus to, to sell out, to panic sell out of those funds. Uh, another thing I think I would say is um, understand that you don't sell stocks just because the price went down. Right. That is not the reason why you sell stocks. If you're buying a stock, it's because you believe in the company. You think it's got a great competitive advantage over its peers, uh, over whether it's through innovation or whether it's through how they market or brand their products. And uh, it's a very long term relationship. You want to you want to own this company because you 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 think highly of the company and their products. So that doesn't change just because the stock price goes down. Right. What changes uh, when you should sell a stock are things like, you know, corporate malfeasance. If, uh, you know, if, if management is caught in some kind of a scam or fraud uh, and then there's no accountability for that. You know, if, if management isn't brought to task and change the culture within the company because of that, you know, that's some, that's a reason why you sell a stock. Um, you sell a stock if they've changed their business model, if those competitive advantages that you saw in that stock when you bought it, if that has changed, you know, if they, something like Intel is a perfect example, it used to be the bellwether te technology stock, the semiconductor stock. And yet then they stopped spending so much on their research and development. They lost that edge uh, that they had over other, other semiconductor companies. And the stock is, has gone nowhere but down over the last you know, 10 years, really. You know, so if a company changes its business model, changes what they had in that competitive advantage, that's uh, that's a reason to sell, not just because the price goes up or down, you know, on any given day or even at any given year on stocks. I've um, heard you talk about I've heard you talk about concentrated stock positions. And uh, if I recall, your rule of thumb was never own more than five percent uh, of your portfolio in one stock. If I heard you properly and and. Everyone's got different rules of thumb. It's five, it's 10, it's some number. I certainly understand why you want the diversification and why you don't want to overweight. It does create a lot of risk. And I think that's true in almost anything. I tell the same thing to people who want to uh, start buying and renting real estate. Don't do it with one property because one bad tenant will sink your, your portfolio there. In the same way, if you own only one stock, you're at, you're at its mercy. How do you how do you uh, discuss company stock when you're an employee of the company? Uh, you know, we watched what happened with Enron years ago. All those folks who suddenly were, um, you know, minted millionaires in their 401ks and it went to literally nothing overnight. There's a lot of risk in holding uh, excess company stock like any other stock, but there's also a lot of patriotism to uh, and and belonging and sense of. Uh, of of ownership in a different way. So how do you how do you counsel that? Does that follow the the same rule? I, I, absolutely. In fact, I would say even less uh, a lot of times. And I realize people get stock options, uh, so maybe they have those concentrated positions. Maybe it's just a matter of, like you said, it's it's pride in where they work and that that uh, you know loyalty to to where they work uh, that they want to build up and buy as much shares as possible to, to support the company. Uh, one thing I would say is by buying the stock, you're really not not necessarily supporting the company because the company doesn't get that money. When you buy and sell right. stock, that, that money is going to another investor, right? So you're not necessarily supporting the company. You're, you can show your support by owning some of the shares, but uh, it was something you really, a lot of investors need to understand. And I think Enron is a great example of that, uh, is the is the income risk and financial risk, right? And you do not want those two aligned. Okay, by income risk, we're talking about where you work, you know, how you make your money, how you make an income. Uh, by financial risk, we're talking about the value of your stocks and your your assets, your other financial assets and your investments. Okay, so now what you want to do uh, optimally when you're looking at your portfolio and, and what to you know what to invest in is is that tied or are you putting those two risks together and and amplifying them right so if i work at intel and uh you know i get lots of stock from from intel if the semiconductor industry or or you know if the economy if the economy falls the semiconductor industry falls i could lose my job at the same time that stock is going down so i lose both my i, I lose both my income as well as my financial the value of my financial assets Right. So that's the real danger when you combine, uh, you know, lots of stock at where you work at, 
you know, if you if you lose your job at the same time, you lose lose the value of your stocks and are forced maybe to sell those stocks because you've lost your income. So now you need money and you have to sell those stocks at the worst possible moment when they've gone down. It can be, you know, it can be also uh, not necessarily even where you're working at, but if you, so if I work at Intel, but I'm investing almost exclusively in all these other semiconductor companies, right? Which mm -hmm. I don't know what that would say about Intel if I was investing in the other semiconductor companies. But, right. uh, but again, you know, if the semiconductor uh, industry falls, then I could potentially lose my job, lose my income, as well as uh, see my financial assets fall as well. So you always need to be thinking about that aspect of investing as well. You know, what is separating my income risk from my financial risk uh, and invest maybe in, in some companies that, that aren't. Um, one more thing about that uh, is thinking about that. If you're, if the job you work in, in which you work or the industry in which you work is extremely cyclical, you know, those are things like technology, things like construction, things like manufacturing, where the layoffs tend to be higher in a recession uh, when the economy falls, then maybe you want to position your stocks and your investments in something a little safer, right? So you're balancing that higher income risk with, uh, you know, something that's, that's a little bit more stable. So you're investing in maybe a little bit more stable uh, sectors or industries like utilities, like consumer staples, things like that. Um, so it's, it's a great way to think about your investments to really balance out the different risks in your life. I like that a lot because what you're doing is you're, you're essentially equating human capital, which is your own ability to work and earn in an industry to an investment. And I, I've, I've seen PhDs, uh, you know, hammer that out and decide whether that's a legitimate thing. And I think particularly for younger people who have longer careers in front of them, that's, that's definitely true because you're, you're putting your, uh, your eggs in that basket somewhat. Um, let's talk about one other thing before we, we get to some of our key questions here at the end of the show. How important is diversification across borders? How important in a world where every company is global or they don't exist, does it matter where a company is domiciled anymore? Do you still need to hold international or emerging market stocks? Does that really help you diversify or not? And I, I, I'm not uh, teeing you up for a, a, a surprise answer or anything. I, I'm literally curious what you think because I, in a world where multi-billion dollar companies do business all over the globe or they don't exist, does it matter where they're domiciled anymore? And if so, why? Sure, sure. And, and you know, I used to, I actually started, uh, you know, when I started my career in, in investment analysis, I did a lot of work in, in emerging markets. Uh, first conference I ever went to, the, uh, you know, asked to speak on a, on a panel at a Bloomberg conference uh, about emerging market stocks. And I was drinking the punch, right? You know, emerging markets, they're gonna, they're gonna make us all rich. They're gonna growing so much faster than, than others. And, uh, you know, after after more than 20 years investing, more than 10 years uh, as, as an equity analyst, uh, it's, it's, it really doesn't make ne nearly as much difference, right? I think uh, at most, I think people need maybe an international fund. So uh, one of those ETFs or one of those funds that do hold some international exposure, some international stocks specifically. Um, but like you said, it, you know, the especially the S&P 500 companies, the 500 largest companies in the United States, uh, they have so much international exposure, uh, upwards of 35, 40% of their revenue is generated overseas. So you're getting that international exposure, uh, but you're also getting you know the kind of uh, the the kind of system of laws and the legal protections and uh, just just the I mean I, I don't want to be too too nationalist here, but uh, just just the, the the great way that a lot of American firms are run. Uh, you know I've lived overseas for for a, a large part of my life and, and have seen how a lot of companies the legal system isn't quite as well established. Uh, companies are not run with that shareholder focus in mind. Um, and, and, and it's just too bad because it's, it's actually holding those economies back. Uh, but, but there is no better, no better country in the world to invest in than, than the United States and the companies within it. Fantastic. So I have to ask you, Joseph, what do you want to be when you grow up? I can't let you leave the show without, <laughs> without deciding. And, and it doesn't have to be what you want to be. It might be who you want to be, but what's, what's next for you? Where do you want to go? Sure, sure. Well, you know, I, I mean, uh, I, I guess anyone from our generation, uh, we started we started out, we would have been wanted to be veterinarians or, or uh, astronauts or or whatever, right? The old standby. Uh, you ask any kid today, and what do they say? The top the top five. There's YouTuber. There's TikToker. Mm -hmm. There's influencer, mm -hmm. right? Uh, mm -hmm. And um, I guess I, you know what I, I think I've I've uh, I, I've you know in touch with my my, my younger self and. I want to be a YouTuber. I mean, I love what I do. Uh, I, I, I love, 
I, I love the investment aspect of it and, and being able to, to to look at those stocks and really follow the markets. But I think the biggest the, the biggest joy that I get is yeah being able to to have that face to face connection with so many people and really build building that community uh, around it. Uh, there's just there's just nothing like it. It is it is a great feeling. Well, and you are a YouTuber, my friend, and I've enjoyed some of your material. So I, I will definitely be following you. Uh, last question for our audience, because we don't believe in homework here, but we do like extra credit assignments. Um, for our listeners, for our viewers, what is the one thing, the one takeaway or the one thing um, that you think actionably someone ought to do having spent some time with us today? Sure. Well, you know what? I, I actually got to I got to look over into my notes. I've got a tab. I've got a calendar in Excel that I use uh, for daily tasks. And one of the tabs is 1% better, right? And it's all the things within uh, my family, you know, uh, uh, my life, uh, health, and business, uh, little things that can make me 1% better in that. And so I wanted to look back on that because I've got, uh, you know, for the family part, I, I've got 15 minutes each day just talking to talking to my kids, right? And it doesn't have to be deep uh, father, son, father, daughter advice that's going to change mm -hmm. their lives. Just 15 minutes talking to that one uh, child, you know, not, not just to everybody, just that one child, 15 minutes. Um, and and I want another thing, you know, engage in one thing they're interested in per week. And, you know, my son is completely all in on Fortnite right now. I could okay. care less, you know, right. Uh, I, I don't understand it. I don't know it, but it is his world right now. So, you know, spend spend 15 minutes a week just talking to him about Fortnite and, and uh, you know, engaging him with that. Um, and, and what I think you'll find is that, um, yeah, you're, you're not trying you're not trying too hard on this. You're not trying to create those those uh, those moments uh, that, that you'll remember forever. But you will, you know, 15 minutes talking to each each of your kids each week, uh, just engage with them in one thing they, they really enjoy their world each week. Uh, or 15 minutes each day, right? Uh, you'll, you'll create those moments, you know, those, those, those memorable moments that they will remember for the rest of their lives. Uh, it'll just come naturally out of that. Uh, it, so I it, think it's, it's a really, it's a really low bar to set that, that creates those really, uh, those great memorable moments for them. Well, it's sage advice. And I think that means I'm going to learn a lot more about animal crossing and Henry danger. Uh, which is what's going on at our house most of the time. So great advice. Joseph, where can people learn more about you? Where can they check out your 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 content, your channel, join Bowtie Nation? I'm very disappointed, by the way, that you're not in a bow tie today. Uh, I was fully expecting yes. that. Uh, and, and I feel like maybe I haven't qualified to be part of Bowtie Nation yet. So I'll just keep working at it. Well, you know, I, I didn't want to go full nerd. Uh, I, I wanted to <laughs> ease in, ease people into uh -huh. uh, the idea. But but yeah, you know, check it out. Uh, uh, the nerd and proud uh, Bowtie Nation over there on the Let's Talk Money channel on YouTube. Uh, I'd love to, you know, everybody to come over and, and check it out and join the community. Uh, like I said, that's that's really what I get from it is is that sense of of face to face interactions and engagement and community with with everyone there on the uh, on the channel. Joseph, thanks for being on Don't Retire, Graduate. You've been a great guest and, and we'll be putting your, your content uh, in our show notes so people can check you out. Thank you. I appreciate it, Eric. Thank you. And thanks to all of you for listening and now watching Don't Retire, Graduate. We'd love to hear from you. So please send us a message on social media or email us or post at Brotman Planning on Twitter. We'd love to know if you have questions for office hours, if you have guests you'd like to see us interview, uh, or just how you're doing in the Don't Retire Graduate movement. We'll be back next week with another episode of Office Hours and in two weeks with another engaging guest. For now, this is your host, and yes, Joseph, valedictorian. Eric Brotman reminding you, don't retire, graduate. We'll see you next week. Securities offered through Kestra Investment Services, LLC. Kestra IS, member FINRA, SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through Kestra Advisory Services, LLC. Kestra AS, an affiliate of Kestra IS. Kestra IS or Kestra AS are not affiliated with Brotman Financial or any other entity discussed.